All right, Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes. We're continuing. Illustrated by Land Ward and published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. We're in chapter eight, and we just uh, read a short section about Johnny and Scylla's relationship, kind of moving forward, changing as they grow older, and that even though she's being courted by, it seems, by Rab, that he's coming and walking her around, which would be the proper thing to do. Uh, she doesn't really consider him to be a legitimate suitor, even though he's very pleasant, uh, but she has always been thinking about Johnny. Uh, since her mom said she had to marry him, that's just how she sees it, and so then she talks about the, having a last name and young girls do this I mean I'm a girl and I did the same thing when I was young you think about oh well who am I going to marry and what's his last name and how am I going to sign that and what's it going to look like and you you just I don't know it's just part of what women, women do I guess but um, so she is telling Johnny like her secrets about um, what she thinks about his name and then Johnny agrees, which is like ee, kind of embarrassing for both of them, kind of awkward. They don't really know what to do. But anyway, it's a sweet little section. But this section coming, section five, is quite a big deal. So let's get into it. It was fall. And for the last time, Sam Adams bade Johnny summon the observers for eight o'clock that night. After this, we will not meet again. For I believe Gage knows all about us. He might be moved to arrest Mr. Lorne. He might send soldiers to arrest us all. I hardly think they would hang the whole club, sir. Only you and Mr. Hancock. <laughs> Johnny had meant this for a compliment, but Sam Adams looked more startled than pleased. It has been noticed that every so often many of us are seen going up and down Salt Lane, entering the printing shop. So it's like their secret place is not so secret anymore. We must, in the future, meet in small groups. But once more, and for the last time, and make as good a punch for us as you can. As Johnny went from house to house, talking about unpaid bills of eight shillings, he was thinking of the punch. Not one ship had come into Boston for five months, except British ships. Only the British officers had limes, lemons, and oranges these days. They and their friends among the Boston Tories. Miss Light had God's plenty of friends among the British officers. He'd get his tropical fruit there. Mrs. Bessie listened to him. And who's going to eat these fruits or drink them if I do give you some? Well, Sam Adams for one. Don't say any more. Give me your dispatch bag, Johnny. She returned with it bulging. No limes, though. Izzy eats them all. <laughs> Does she do tricks for them like she used to for the sailors along Hancock's Wharf? Huh, tricks? Does she do tricks? L Lieutenant Stranger has taught her a rigmarole about poor Nell Gwynne selling fruit at a theater. I don't need to tell you how she carries on. Remember, Izzy is, or <laughs> she is very theatrical. She's kind of silly now. What happened to that cousin Sewell? Gone to Worcester, joined up with the Minutemen. But he's too fat and soft? No, from now on, nobody's too fat nor soft, nor old nor young. The time's coming. It would be a small meeting, for of the 22 original members, many had already left town to get away from the threat of arrest by the British. Josiah Quincy was in England, of the three revolutionary doctors, only Church and Warren remained. Dr. Young had gone to a safer spot. James Otis was at the moment in Boston. Johnny had not notified him, although he had founded this club in the first place. Okay, and we've been reading about James Otis in our social studies book. Ever since he had grown so queer, the other members did not wish him about. Even in his lucid periods, that means when he's clear-minded. He talked and talked. Nobody could get a word in edgewise when James Otis talked. This, the last meeting, started with the punch bowl on the table instead of ending with it. There was no chairman, nor was there any time when the two boys were supposed to withdraw. 
they were talking about how Gage had at last dared send out a sortie beyond the gate of Boston, and before the Minutemen got word of their plans, they had seized cannon and gunpowder over in Charlestown, got into their boats, and back to Boston. Not one shot had been fired, and it was all too late when the alarm had been spread and thousands of armed farmers had arrived. By then the British were safe home again. Yet, Sam Adams protested, this rising up of an army of a thousand from the very soil of New England had badly frightened General Gage. Once the alarm spread that the British had left Boston, the system of calling up the Minutemen had worked well indeed. The trouble had been in Boston itself. In other words, gentlemen, it was our fault. If we could have known but an hour, two hours in advance what the British were intending, our men would have been there before the British troops arrived instead of a half hour after they left. Johnny had been told off to carry letters for the British officers to keep on good terms with their grooms and stable boys over at the Afric Queen. Somehow he had failed. He hadn't known. Nobody had known that 260 redcoats were getting into boats, slipping off up the mystic, seizing Yankee gunpowder, and rowing it back to Castle Island for themselves. <sighs> Paul Revere was saying, we must organize a better system of watching their movements, but in such a way that they will not realize they are being watched. Sam and John Adams were standing, and the other members were crowding about them, shaking hands with them, wishing them success at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. They were starting the next day. Everyone was ready to give them advice on whom to see, what to say, or to prophesy the outcome of this Congress, like to think of what it would be predicted. Paul Revere and Joseph Warren were apart a little, making plans for that spy system which was needed badly. They called Johnny to them, but he could hear one of the men standing about the two Adamses saying, But there must be some hope we can still patch up our differences with England. Sir, you will work for peace? Sam Adams said nothing for a moment. He trusted these men about him as he trusted no one else in the world. No. That time is past. I will work for war. The complete freedom of these colonies from any European power. We can have that freedom only by fighting for it. God grant that we fight soon. For ten years we've tried this and we've tried that. We've tried to placate them and they to placate us. And that means like, like putting a band-aid on a small injury. Like, oh, well, let's just do this. Let's just do that. Gentlemen, you know it has not worked. I will not work for peace. Peace, peace. And there is no peace. But I will, in Philadelphia, play a cautious part. Not throw all my cards on the table. Oh, no. But nevertheless, I will work for but one thing. War. Bloody and terrible death and destruction. But out of it shall come such a country as was never seen on this earth before. We will fight. There was a heavy footsteps, uh, a footstep across the floor of the shop below. Rab leaped to the ladder's head. James Otis, he reported to the men standing about Adams. Well, said Adam, Sam Adams a little crossly. No one needs to stay and listen to him. He shot his bolt years ago, still talking about the natural rights of man and the glories of the British Empire. You and I, John, had as well go home and get a good night's sleep before leaving at dawn tomorrow. Otis pulled his bulk up the ladder. If no one was glad to see him, at least no one was so discourteous as to leave. Mr. Otis was immediately shown every honor, given a comfortable armchair and a tankard of punch. Seemingly, he was not in a talkative mood tonight. The broad, ruddy, good-natured face turned left and right, nodding casually to his friends, 
taking it for granted that he was still a great man among them. Instead of a milestone, they all believed they had passed years before. He sniffed at his punch and sipped a little. Sammy, he said to Sam Adams, my coming interrupted something you were saying. We will fight. You had got that far. Why, yes, that's no secret. For what will we fight? To free Boston from these infernal redcoats and... No, said Otis. Boy, give me more punch. That's not enough reason for going into a war. Did any occupied city ever have better treatment than we've had from the British? Has one rebellious new newspaper been stopped? One treasonable speech? Where are the firing squads? The jails jammed with political prisoners. What about the gallows for you, Sam Adams, and you, John Hancock? It has never been set up. I hate those infernal British troops spread all over my town as much as you do. Can't move these days without stepping on a soldier. But we are not going off into a civil war merely to get them out of Boston. Why are we going to fight? Why? Why? Hmm. There was an embarrassed silence. Sam Adams was the acknowledged ringleader. It was for him to speak now. We will fight for the rights of Americans. England cannot take our money away by taxes. No. No. For something more important than the pocketbooks of our American citizens. Rab said, for the rights of Englishmen everywhere. Why stop with Englishmen? Otis was warming up. He had a wide mouth, crooked and generous. He settled back in his chair, and then he began to talk. It was such talk as Johnny had never heard before. The words surged up through his big body, flowed out of the broad mouth. He never raised his voice, and he went on and on. Sometimes Johnny felt so intoxicated by the mere sound of the words that he hardly followed the sense. That soft, low voice flowed over him, submerged him. For men and women and children all over the world, he said, you were right, you tall, dark boy, for even as we shoot down the British soldiers, we are fighting for the rights such as they will be, enjoying a hundred years from now. There shall be no more tyranny. A handful of men cannot seize power over thousands. A man shall choose who it is, shall rule over him. The peasants of France, the serfs of Russia, hardly more than animals now. But because we fight, they shall see freedom like a new sun rising in the west. Those natural rights God has given to every man, no matter how humble. He smiled suddenly and said, or crazy, and took a good pull at his tankard. He knows that all the men think that he's crazy. He knows it, and he's saying right there. The battle we win over the worst in England shall benefit the best in England. How well are they over there represented when it comes to taxes? Not very well. It will be better for them when we have won this war. Will French peasants go on forever pulling off their caps and saying, oui, monsieur, when the gold coaches run down their children? They will not. Italy and all those German states, are they nothing but soldiers? Will no one show them the rights of good citizens? So we hold up our torch and do not forget it was lighted upon the fires of England, and we will set it as a new sun to lighten the world. Sam Adams, anxious to get that good night's sleep before starting next day for Philadelphia, was 
smiling slightly, nodding his gray head, seeming to agree. He was bored. It does not matter, he was thinking, what James Otis says these days, sane or crazy. Joseph Warren's fair, responsive face was aflame. The torch of Otis had been talking about seemed reflected in his eyes. We are lucky men, he murmured, for we have a cause worth dying for. This honor is not given to every generation. Boy, said Otis to Johnny, fill my tankard. It was not until he had drained it and wiped his mouth on the back of his hand that he spoke again. All sat silently waiting for him. He had, and not for the first time, cast a spell upon them. They say, he began again, my wits left me after I got hit on the head by that customs official. That's what you think, eh, Mr. Sam Adams? Oh, no, no, indeed, Mr. Otis. Some of us will give our wits, he said. Some of us all our property. Heh, John Hancock, did you hear that? Property, that hurts, eh? To give one's silver wine coolers, one's coach and four, and the gold buttons off one's sprigged satin waistcoats. Hancock looked him straight in the face, and Johnny had never before liked him so well. I am ready, he said. I can get along without all that. You, Paul Revere, you'll give up that silver craft you love. God made you to make silver, not war. Revere smiled. There's a time for the casting of silver and a time for the casting of cannon. If that's not in the Bible, it should be. Dr. Warren, you've a young family. You know quite well if you get killed, they may literally starve. Warren said, I've thought of all that long ago. And you, John Adams, you've built up a very nice little law practice, stealing away my clients, I notice. Ah, well, so it goes. Each shall give according to his own abilities. And some, he turned directly to Rab, some will give their lives. All the years of their maturity, all the children they never lived to have, the serenity of old age. To die so young is more than merely dying. It is to lose so large a part of life. Rab was looking straight at Otis. His arms were folded across his chest. His head flung back a little. His lips parted as though he would speak, but he did not. Even you, my old friend, my old enemy, how shall I call you, Sam Adams? Even you will give the best you have a genius for politics. Oh, pff, go to Philadelphia. Pull all the wool, pull all the strings and all the wires. Yes, go, go. And God go with you. We need you, Sam. We must fight this war. You'll play your part. But what it is really about, you'll never know. James Otis was on his feet, his head close against the rafters that cut down into the attic, making it the shape of a tent. Otis put out his arms. It is all so much simpler than you think, he said. He lifted his hands and pushed against the rafters. We give all we have. Lives, property, safety, skills. We fight. We die for a simple thing. Only that a man can stand up. With a curt nod, he was gone. Johnny was standing close to Rab. It had frightened him when Mr. Otis had said, Some will give their lives and looked straight at Rab. Die so that a man can stand up. Once more, Sam Adams had the center of attention. He was again buttoning up his coat, preparing to leave. But first he turned to Revere. <sighs> now he is gone. We can talk a moment about that spy system you think you can organize in Boston. Paul Revere, like his friend Joseph Warren, was still slightly under the spell of James Otis. 
I had not thought about it that way before, he said, not answering Sam Adams's words. You know, my father had to flee France because of the tyranny over there. He was only a child. But now, in a way, I'm fighting for that child, that no frightened, lost child ever is sent out a refugee from his own country because of race or religion. Then he pulled himself together and answered Sam Adams's remarks about the spy system. That night, when the boys were both in bed, Johnny heard Rab, usually a heavy sleeper, turning and turning. Johnny, he said at last, are you awake? Yes. What was it, he said? That a man can stand up. Rab sighed and stopped turning. In a few moments, he was asleep. As often had happened before, it was the younger boy who lay wide awake, wide-eyed in the darkness. That a man can stand up. He'd never forget Otis with his hands pushed up against the cramping rafters over his head. That a man can stand up. As simple as that. And the strange new sun rising in the west. A sun that was to illuminate a world to come. Ah, democracy. What an excellent section. Come back for the next parts. Such a great book. See you on the next video.